Christ is very specific. The Bible is very specific, but ultimately what happens is we try, we try to pick and choose. We try to make it, we try to, we try to make it fit our life. We don't want to adapt to the word. We want the word to adapt to us. That's backwards, right? So tonight I'm gonna talk a, a little bit about the strong delusion. Um, we're gonna come out of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We'll look at a couple of uh, different precepts and, and other texts that kind of support the scripture, but we're not going to go as in depth tonight as we will tomorrow. Um, just for the sake of time, and so everyone can can go and rest and be with their families and different things on those lines. All right, all right. So, um, as mentioned tonight, we're talking about um the strong delusion. We're coming out of Second Th Thessalonians. Um, it says chapter two and eleven, but really we're going to get into the whole chapter. Um, so. Just a little bit about us, if this is your first time. Um, Seven Seal, that's 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 who we are. Um, that's this division that the most high had given us as far as who we're called to reach, as far as reaching out to the remnant believers, whether that be the individuals that um are of Israel, or you have believers that are, are Gentile or of who are in Christ but don't identify as Israel, but they still display their characteristics of the remnant believers as far as their desire to walk in purity and according to God's heart, right? So as you see, we come from Ezekiel 11, 17, Jeremiah 23, Michael 4, and 6. Um, and we're committed to, to partnering with the Father as far as doing the work to gather the remnant. Um, we're diverse and multi-generational. That means we have different age groups among us. And our sole purpose is to spread the doctrine of Christ, the unified believers in spirit and truth. All right. So we know a lot of people have a lot of different ways of breaking down scripture, but like we believe in a purity and the accuracy of the word. And we believe that the scripture interprets itself. So, right. you know, we appreciate different commentaries and different things along those lines. But we we are firmly rooted in the fact that we know that the word of God interprets itself. Right. So that's kind of what we stand on. And, and that's what we go by. All right. Um, so so key terms that I want us to look at for tonight that we're going to be dealing with is um, you got the word strong. We have the word delusion. We have the the aspect of the day of Christ, and then we also have the word a lot, all right? So I wanted to put these terms up here because I know a lot of times when when you start getting into discussions like this or you start to, um, you know, try to break it down and have understanding, you know, different people who are very big on the words, you know, they're going to look it up. And one thing I've noticed is when it comes to pulling the understanding from the concordance, you know, the concordance might, it's like a, it's like a dictionary, right? But it relates us back to the Hebrew and the Greek. So there'll be five or six definitions sometimes and individuals will oftentimes they'll pick a definition that fits the interpretation they want to receive, but they don't want to put it in context with what the rest of the verse or the rest of that chapter is saying. So you, you'll kind of get an understanding of that because there's an example I'm going to use as we get into the text. But I wanted to just pull from the concordance, the explanation or the original definitions of what these words mean. So when we actually see it in the text, we can get a little bit more full and understanding, right? So the way that the concordance breaks down strong, it says it is working if it, it deals with being uh, working or it deals with the level of efficiency. And it also says that it's of superhuman power, whether of God or the devil, all right? Delusion, the, the concordance says that delusion, the word that means delusion in that sense is a wandering, a straying about, one let astray from the right way, mental strain, error, Wrong opinion relative to morals, right? Um, the day of Christ, scriptural references as far as to, to break that down and explain what that means. We see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7. And we also see that in Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 through 21, all right? So these are some scriptures that you can take note of. Um, we're not going to get into those tonight, but it, we will break them down tomorrow. But pretty much what those verses are, are doing is they're showing us how to contextualize the day of Christ. Because you'll have some people that that teach that the day of Christ already came inadvertently, and sometimes they don't even realize that's what they're that's what they're talking about. But we know that the word teaches us that that doesn't happen until the end, until everything is coming to an end, right? That's when that's when Christ cracked the sky. He come with his angels and all that, and it's you know so that's that. And then the word lie, it just flat out means a lie, right? It means a conscious and intentional falsehood. That means like you know what you're doing. And then it also says in a more broader sense, it's, it's whatever is not what it seems to be, whatever is perverse, impious. And, and one thing I found was really ill is it says deceitful precepts, right? So these lies and different things that we're going to see covered in 2 Thessalonians, like the word, when it says that they will believe a lie, it's talking about these deceitful precepts. 
one of my understandings and one of my hopes here is that as, as we're going through this text and as we're, we're going through this lesson tonight, it will encourage you not only to, to be more strengthened in the faith, but also it'll give you some understanding and strengthen. Well, really, as, as the, the edification I receive, more of an encouragement. So when we are getting the discussions or if we are trying to preach the truth of Christ and individuals aren't receiving it, not necessarily looking at them a certain kind of way, but just really that should, that should draw us to have the heart of Christ, which is one of pity and compassion, understanding that it's like, okay, individuals, like we know that the strong delusion is being emanated. We know that people are being led hooded, all these different falsehoods. And we know that the word tells us that, that if the most high sin in the strong delusion, that people will believe a lie. You know, and, and some of the precepts they're believing or the, the ways they interpret the scripture might be all then having that, that compassion and saying, OK, like if this is something the Lord is doing, I can't really wrestle with that. All I can do is intercede. And it gives me more peace and understanding what the, what the scripture says, dust off your shoes. Right. If you extend your peace, they don't receive it. Dust off your shoes and just, you know, commit them to the hands of the Lord and pray that if you know that he would be the one to open their eyes. All right. So from there. Let's 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 see some key points that I want to highlight. All right. So with Second Thessalonians chapter two, and really the whole chapter is is these are some key points that I saw when I was going through and I was breaking it down and I was looking at it and I was like, okay, so and I was and I, you know I was just asking asking the Father, you know, how do you how what are some key points? What do you want us to see within this passage, right? And so there's some things that we see here. It says five key points, right? So we see deception occurs at the time of the gathering together. Right. And this is this is key. Right. Well, not just for this discussion, but understanding like the entire vision behind what we're doing in Christ, the, the entire vision behind what you're doing, wherever you're planted or wherever the most high has you working, understanding that like we're in a time of that gathering. Everywhere we look and prophetically, we see that we're in that time of gathering. Right. So it says that this this deception, right, the strong delusion that, that the father said he's going to sin. Is, is gonna occur at the time of the gathering together, which is the time that we're seeing, right? It also says that the man of sin and perdition must be revealed first before the, uh, before the day of Christ. And we see this coming as far as the falling away. And we also see the man of sin or the man of perdition, you know, this is where he starts to, to try to, well, this is not what he tries to, but this is where he begins to see himself in the temple of God, right? And he, he sees himself there as God. And, and I looked at the following away, and it basically said forsaken truth or defection and concordance, right? Um, another thing that we see is we see a, a grace period. A lot of people that believe in dispensationalism, they believe we're in a period of grace. And after I did this study, I was looking at it. I was like, you know what? As much as I don't really agree with dispensationalism, I think when they talk about this grace period or we're, we're in the time of grace, you know, there might be some merit to it. I think the how they interpret it is different though and we'll talk about that and then number four key point is understanding that it's it's the father who sends the strong delusion all right the father sends the strong delusion because the the, the people didn't want to receive the truth right and so he did it so that way they would believe the lie that they were so comfortable with so that way they could reap the reward of what their hearts desire if that makes sense and then the last thing is um we see that um the holy spirit through paul in the writing says that you know, he tells us to hold fast to the traditions. And when I looked in the concordance for the word for traditions, you know, it went down and talked about precepts and what the instructions and stuff that was passed on. Right. And it tells us to hold fast to this because ultimately this is this is what we're going to see us um, walking in truth in Christ and also being covered and protected from the strong delusion. All right. So with that, let me let me exit out of this so we can look at the um, so we can look at the word. So I'm gonna start at second, second Thessalonians chapter two, verse one, all right? It says, now brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to, not to be soon shaken in the mind or troubled either by word or by letter, as if from of us, I'm sorry, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first, and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Do you not remember that when I was with you, I told you these things? 
And now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. It's talking about Christ right there. And it says, and then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders, and with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. And for this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth but have pleasure in unrighteousness, right? And picking up at verse 13, it says, but we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the spirit and belief in the truth, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand fast and hold the traditions, that's the word traditions, that mean precepts, which you were taught, whether by our word or by our letter. Now may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and our God and Father who has loved us and given us everlasting consolation and good hope by grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. All right. So what does all of this mean? And why is this all significant? We, we have to understand that it's all significant as far as the times that we live in. And the reason why all of this is significant, the reason why all of this matters is because a lot of people don't know the times that we live in. A lot of people don't understand what what's going on. A lot of people don't know, man, there's, there's a lot of people out here who are claiming to be prophets. There's a lot of people who are in all these different pulpits that are teaching that are trying to, trying to lead churches and plant churches and do all of this different stuff. But the word says, you know, how can the people hear unless, you know, unless someone preaches, right? But it also says, how can someone preach unless it be sent? But we also see prophetically that the Most High also says, you know, they got people that are running, but he ain't sent them, right? And we got people that are speaking, saying that the Lord told them this and the Lord told them that. But he said he hasn't spoken anything to these people. So right now we have a lot of people. There's so much corruption in the body of Christ. There's so much corruption throughout the earth with the word of God that there's individuals that are putting off this image and this form of godliness, but it's really leading people down to deception. And because the individuals are so deceived and because the word is being so mishandled, and the precepts are being so misconfused and misapplied and different things along those lines. Ultimately, what's happened is a lot of people can't recognize the signs of the times. And this is the same issue that Christ had with his disciples. You know, he said, you can tell when, when, when it's about to be summer and all of this other stuff, but you can't recognize the signs of the times. It's the same thing now. You have people who claim to be believers in Christ. You have people who claim to be of the faith and different things along those lines. But if you talk to them about where we are prophetically, What's happening now, based off of what we see in the word of God, the average believer can't tell you what, where we are, right? So I want us to look at these signs of the strong delusion, and then I want us to, then we're going to break down, I'm, we're going to break down the text, right? So signs of the strong delusion, right? We see that there's a falling away. This text teaches us that this falling away is a rebellion against the truth, and it's a defection in the faith. And I think one thing that's key about the word defection is the root word of defection is defect. That means there's a flaw in their faith. So that's where that rebellion comes from. There's a flaw in the truth that they have, right? It also meant, uh, it's, it's also an abandonment of proper precepts and traditions, right? Kind of like we talked about earlier. It's a preparation for the lawless man, right? So in order for people to receive the man of sin of perdition, you know, there, there has to be a, a, a level of lawlessness already present, right? Otherwise, it's going to throw people off. Like the way the human body, the human mind works is when something looks different, it, it causes us to hesitate a little bit, right? So in order for the lawless man to be revealed or the son of per perdition to be, to be revealed in a way that people are going to receive him, there has to already be a spirit of lawlessness that's going forth, right? And when you're thinking about a spirit of lawlessness that's going forth, also, also think about, you know, when, um, when Paul was saying, like, there's many antichrists among you, right? So you have many people that are operating in the antichrist spirit, but they're not the antichrist, right? But it's kind of like a, how John the Baptist was paving the way for Christ. It's like these are these are Satan's disciples and Satan's minions kind of announcing the way for, for, for the Antichrist when he gets here, right? So if the lawless one is coming, then we understand that the spirit of lawlessness is being removed. And you have people that are walking in the spirit of lawlessness, 
that is cultivating and preparing the hearts and the minds of people to receive the lawless one when he comes, right? And now all of this is significant because it's all in the text. It's all in the prophecy, but people don't understand prophecy because they don't have the spirit of Christ, right? And that might sound strong, but that's just the truth. And if we don't talk about it in a true, man, true state of mind, then how are people going to understand that they're walking in deception, right? So because people don't have the spirit of Christ and because people don't understand that there's a strong lawlessness that's, that's emanating over the earth, people are in rebellion, right? People are rejecting the truth. And a lot of people are believing a false teaching that you know the day of Christ has already happened. And I'm explain what I mean by that, right? And then we also see a couple other signs, which is, you know, we talk about, um, it talks about the son of perdition being seated in the temple of God. So we need to break down what is the temple of God. And then we also see that it's by the power of Satan. And this is one thing I found interesting because it says it's by the power of Satan, but it didn't necessarily equate the lawless one to Satan if that makes sense, right? And it also says that people will not believe the righteousness of God. So ultimately, when we see the strong delusion being released upon them so that they will believe the lie, it, it ultimately kind of speaks to that aspect of, of that reprobate mind that we see in like Hebrews 10 and 26 and Hebrews 6 and 1 and different things along those lines, right? So thinking about all of this, you know, why does this matter? And, and how, how does all of this how does all of this fit with where we are, right? And so ultimately, we have to, we kind of have to slow down and take this step back and kind of like just disconnect from everything for a minute to really see the full picture, if this makes sense. So there's a lot of distractions right now. There's a lot of distractions right now. There's distractions on social media. As, as cool as the little Clubhouse app is, it's very convenient the timing that it kind of emerged on the surface, right? And, and just every time I turn around, if people ain't on Facebook, they're getting sucked in the clubhouse, right? And um, understandably, right? It's just, it's a platform. Like everyone, it's it's kind of cool, but I'm just saying like the timing of it, you have to pay attention just to see how strategic the enemy can be in the battles that we face. So you see these distractions, you see how um, like as, 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 as convenient as it might be when it comes to the, our ability to, to have like Netflix and Hulu and different things along those lines, ultimately, we kind of just get to watch anything we want on demand, right? So it's like everything is kind of being cultivated where we can kind of build this little cocoon where if we don't want to, to look at the reality of what's happening, we don't have to look at the reality of what's happening, right? Um, when people are looking at certain news media outlets and different things like that, we forget that some like, man, teleprompters. We forget that newscasters read teleprompters. And you have to understand, if you don't know what a teleprompter is, a teleprompter is the little TV, and it's where the newscast, the reporter is just reading what's coming up on the screen, right? So we're watching the media, and we're just, a lot of people are just accepting it all as true. Like, this is true because they said it. This is true because they said it. This is true because they said it. But they're reading something that somebody wrote for them to present to us, right? Beyond that, when they're doing these different interviews, you, like they're handpicking who they're going to come up. The people who come up to do these interviews, they're already told what they can be said and what can't be said. There's already preset questions. They already like talk about and have an understanding of what they're going to pre present, right? But I'm saying all of this to, because I'm trying to highlight the reality of the fact that the world we're living in is so prime for people to be distracted that they can't even see. And it's the worst time for believers in Christ to be distracted because the, the word of God tells us in 2 Thessalonians that at the time of the gathering, like we're seeing right now, at the time of the gathering, that's when we're going to start seeing like things are starting to shift um, for, in preparation for, for the coming of the man of sin and man of perdition and the lawless one, right? I want to back up really quick and I want to look and I want to look at this. All right, so. We see the falling away. We see the preparation for the lawless man. We see people are in rebellion. We see the, the lawless one being seated in the temple of God and different things. But I want to back up, right? And I want us to look at this. And I, want us, and I want us to understand this, right? It says, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of Christ had come. Let no one deceive you by any means. For that day will not come unless the fallen away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. All right. So when we come back here 
we have to ask ourselves, you know, what is the temple of God? What is the temple of God? And the thing we have to know what this is, and this is something that the father was showing me is because like one reason why people are so distracted is because we're looking with our physical eyes, right? We're looking through the flesh. And because we're looking in the flesh, we're not comprehending what's happening in the spirit, right? So people are looking at, okay, well, it looks like this is the prime opportunity where the mark of the beast could show up at any point. True, right? But we see prophetically in the scriptures that Christ talked about, you know, there's a seal of Christ that believers receive, right? And so if there's a seal of Christ in the spirit that believers receive, we also have to understand that if Christ is marking those who belong to him in the spirit, right, then we also have to understand that Satan already has marks, you know what I'm saying, upon uh, on the individuals spiritually that belong to him as well. So a lot of people are looking just for a physical mark of the beast, but a lot of people don't understand that they're already walking and bearing the mark of Satan already, right? But this is key because everyone is focusing on the physical. I know a lot of people that are not in Christ, but they said it will never take the mark of the beast, right? They, when they're looking at it as, as the RFID chip and different, they say they are not in Christ at all. Don't even believe in God, but they say, I'm not taking that. That's the mark of the beast, right? But the funny thing is, it's like they're already in a place where they already had the seal of, uh, they don't have the seal of Christ because they don't even have faith in the one who can save them, right? But it just shows how Satan has distracted us looking at the physical things, right? So beyond that, what does it come back down to the temple of God? This is important because we do know that a temple is being rebuilt, right? We know that this temple is being rebuilt, but we also have to understand we can't forget that that's still like as, as much as in line with prophecy as it is, that's also a distraction too because it keeps us looking at the physical. Christ walked by the temple and said in three days, this temple will be destroyed and rebuilt. Those who weren't thinking in the spirit, who weren't walking in the spirit of Christ, those who weren't in sync with the will of the most high and didn't understand the prophecy, they thought he was talking about the physical temple, right? And they got upset, but they got offended at that, but he was talking about his body. So we see in the text right there, Christ is making a distinguishment. Like you, y'all are looking at this physical temple. I'm talking to you about a different temple now. Right. And the same thing happened with the woman at the well. She's like, you know, we go, which mountain are we going to? He was like, the time is coming. You ain't go, none of that's going to matter. You're going to worship me in spirit and truth. Right. So how do we connect that with scripture? How do we connect? How do we see that interpreted through the other scriptures? Right. And Corinthians, it says, know ye not that you are the temple of the most high God. So when we see the lawless one coming, the man of sin, the son of perdition coming to seat himself in the temple of the most high. We have to understand that it's not just the physical thing that we're looking at. And so many people are looking at this physical thing and they don't even recognize that if, as if the scripture says that if they have faith in Christ and, and they are the temple of the, of, the, of the most high now, if we're the temple of God now, then what the, the temple that the lawless one is seeking to see, be seated at is us, our heart, our mind, right? So we're looking at these things incorrectly. You know what I'm saying? Or if we're looking at them correctly, we're looking at them Sometimes we look at them partially because we prophesy in part and see in part, but we have to understand what's happening right now in order to understand where we are in the prophetic times. And that's where we see this gathering coming in. That's why we see, that's why we see the most high gathering the remnant of Israel. That's why we see the most high putting a conviction on the believers in Christ who are Gentile or who are not of Israel to walk in a different level of purity and righteousness. He's gathering his people because he's sealing his people. He's preparing his people because of the judgment that's about to come. He's gathering his people because he's about to release his strong delusion and start giving people over. So it's in a place where the wheat and the tear are being separated, right? Christ is, is, is seated on the throne of the hearts of the believer. Like the, those, those whose temple is his that are walking in obedience, he, he, they're showing and affirming that he is the Lord of their life. But those who are, reject, who are rejecting Christ as Lord, they're showing that their temple is 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 vacant and ready for the lawless one to sit upon their hearts, right? Now I'm gonna I want to keep going from there because I don't want to throw myself off. But so if we're talking about the lawless one, we have to understand, you know, what does lawless mean? So lawless one, lawless simp is, is self-explanatory. Lawless means without laws, right? If you live in a lawless society. Like we live in America right now. 
if if they just you got matter of fact, I don't even have to talk about it. You y'all seen the movie Purge, right? And the whole movie Purge is about I think it's a 24 hour period where there's it, it's just anarchy. There's no laws and people do whatever they want to do, right? So this is this is interesting because we see this in a movie. But when we come to, to the kingdom of God, when we come to talking about the word of God and, 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 and we're supposed to be brothers and sisters in Christ and living in the kingdom and, you know, manifesting the, the, the truth of the word of God on the earth, you know, and all these different things. We have to understand that the same way that society has laws, the same way that you can't speed and go 55 miles an hour in the 35, the kingdom of heaven has laws, right? And we, we are so quick to say that will be done on earth as it is in heaven, right? But we don't even reckon, sometimes we don't even fully understand what we're praying about, right? Heaven is not a place without laws. But the reason why people get so deceived is because people don't understand the law of God, right? We, 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 the Bible says that there's one lawgiver, right? And it's talking about the most high. But people are quick to say, oh, well, the law of Moses and different things like that, right? But we, what, what people are failing to, to realize that they're doing in that sense is when they start to do, say things like that, they're, they're buying into the deception and, and they're diminishing the truth of the word of God in that moment, right? And I've learned over time why people do this, right? So most recently I had a conversation and someone was asking, excuse me, and we, had, we came to the understanding that um, one reason why a lot of people resist the law of God is because they connect the law of God solely to the covenant that the that the father made with Israel, right? We we make the we we the average individual when they see the word and they talk about the law in the Bible, they connect it to the covenant that the most high made with Israel. And this is this is this is this is the understanding that the father gave me as I was breaking this down and looking at different things, right? First the law of God is the law of God, right? It exists across all of the covenants, right? Because we have to understand that, that, that the father cut a covenant with Israel, right? When he, when he brought him out of Exodus, the father cut a covenant with Noah, the rainbow, remember that? The father cut a covenant with Adam and Eve. The father cut a covenant with, um, with Abraham, right? Like the father constantly cut all these different covenants. He made all of these different covenants and all of these different promises and all of these different things. And, and when we just, when we start to say, okay, well, the law of God is only tied to this one specific covenant, then we're limiting our understanding and limiting, we're limiting the, the truth of God's word in that moment. And the, what proves this is this, right? So in the laws that we see Israel operating in, there's a law of clean and unclean, what you can't eat and what you can't eat. Right. Before that law was 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 written and given physically. Right. These things are like the father already passed this stuff down before it was written. For all we know, this stuff could have been passed down or tradition. Right. And this is just follow what I'm saying on this. Right. So. We see that it was given, you know, eat this, don't eat that. It's, it, you know, he wants us to be healthy. He don't want us to eat stuff that's not meant for us to be eaten. Right. But before that was given, when the most High was dealing with Noah, Right. He said, you know, get these animals on this ark. I'm paraphrasing, but just walk with me. Right. So get put the animals on the ark. Take two of every unclean and seven of every clean. So way before Exodus, when God had flooded the earth, he made a distinction early that this is clean animals and these are unclean animals. Right. That's according to his law. That's according to his instruction. That's according to his wisdom, right? So when we say, okay, well, the, the, the law is bound here and this, we already starting to throw out with the, our precepts are already off, right? Another thing that proves that is the Sabbath, right? People always try to just say, oh, well, like that was made here at Mount Sinai and all that other stuff. Well, when they first came out of Exodus, before they even made it to where the Ten Commandments and everything else kind of came off of that, they were going through the wilderness and they were on their journey. And when they were, the, I think it was when the quail came, you know, the most high told them, go gather double 
because tomorrow's the Sabbath and there's not going to be anything that's going to come. So before it was it was written by Moses and then before Moses broke the tablets and God wrote it with his own finger as far as like keep the Sabbath and different things like that. He had already established with them before it was written because it's something that existed before that covenant was made. And if that if that wasn't the case, then it wouldn't have said it from the very foundation of the world. Because because the most high rested on the seventh day and he himself set it apart. So what happens is people will look at the law of God and they'll say, oh, well, it's, it's bound to this covenant. So that's where people get it wrong. So when they start talking, they say, oh, well, OK, well, Christ came to do away with the law and different things like that. That doesn't make sense. Right. That doesn't make sense because they say, oh, we're not under the old covenant. We're under the new covenant. Well, throughout the Bible, God's people transition through different covenants, but his law never transitioned. His law remained the same because he's the same yesterday, today, and forevermore, right? God's law is him, and he is he's his law, if that makes sense. Like, it's his instructions. It's his wisdom. It's like, he's like, look, this is, this is what it is, right? So we have to understand that. We have to understand that his law was established from the foundation of the world. And if his law wasn't established from the foundation of the world, then why in Revelation would it tell us that Christ was, the lamb was slain from the foundation of the world? That, 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 I'm, I'll get into that another day, right? So the second point is we have to understand the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, right? That's another thing people like to say, but they say the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, right? We have to understand that the letter of the law is what leads to death, but the spirit of the law is what leads to life, right? The letter of the law is, 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 is more so like I talked about earlier, where people aren't seeing through the spirit, people are seeing purely through the flesh, right? People are, are walking in hypocrisy. People are walking in unrighteous judgment and people are doing everything that corrupts the word of God, that mishandles the truth for the word and that, and, and that makes God's law look like something that is not or wasn't intended to be, right? So that's why it says the letter leads to death, but the spirit of the law leads to life, right? The spirit leads life. So we have to understand that this, what is the spirit of the law? What is the spirit behind the law? Right. And we have to understand that, like. Like we, we're told that the greatest and um, commandment is love God with all your heart, mind, body and soul. The second is like unto the first. And, and Christ didn't say these are the only two. He said this is what is basically he said this is the found on everything else hangs on these two. Right. And so we see that both of those deal with the love of the father. Right. And so the scripture tells us that God is so many things, but the scripture also tells us that God is love. Right. God is merciful. He's just, he's righteous in all these different things. So the spirit behind the law of God is the spirit of God himself. So the foundation of everything is the love of God. Like it's, it's his wisdom. It's just everything he is is summed up in those things. And that's what he's presented to us. Right. So when we say, when we, when we're talking about that, we have to understand what, like, that's where Galatians and all that stuff starts to come in when it says like, if you're walking in the spirit against it, such, there is no love. Because when you're walking in the spirit, you're bearing the fruit of the spirit, which is different manifestation of God's love, different manifestations of God's character. And there's no law against God. There's no law against God's character. If anything, the law was supposed to teach and produce that in us. Right. But if we don't have the spirit of Christ, no matter how much of that you do, it's not going to produce that in you. It's, it takes you have to do it in the spirit. Right. And that's what Christ was coming to bring the understanding to him because they were doing it wrong. He was like, no, this it's not done away with, but y'all doing it wrong. So let me come and show you how it's done, right? And then I think I already hit on point number three, but love is the root, right? The root of God's love is, is, is God's law is God, right? The root and he's love, right? So to do away with the law is to do away with God. And, and to do away with God is to do away with love and to do away with his spirit. And, and that's, not, that's not happening, right? So I wanna hit on, I'm hitting on these because we have to understand this spirit of lawlessness you know what I'm saying? Why it's being permeated through the earth. And I'm, I'm going to wrap, I'm wrapping this up soon. Right. But I'm going to hit on these and then, um, yeah, I'm going to hit on these and I'm, I'm going to come back on camera and I'm going to finish breaking it down. But Matthew 5, 17, verse 18, it says, think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy, but to fulfill for verily I say unto you till heaven and earth pass, not one jot, a uh, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled, right? When is all fulfilled? Revelation chapter 21, verse one, it says, and I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea, right? So, so why, why does this matter? 
why does this matter? All right. So the reason why this matters is so if, if we're in a time, if we're in a prophetic time of the gathering of Israel, if we're in a prophetic time where the Most High is gathering the, the remnant of Israel, and he's also gathering the remnant of the body of Christ that desires that purity, that's, that's, that's seeking after him in spirit and in truth, we have to understand that we're also in a time of where the man of the perdition is, is being, like the way his way is being prepared. And we have to ask ourselves, what is this spirit of lawlessness? What, is, what are these little antichrists that are running around? Right? They're, they're preaching against the word of God. They're preaching, and the word of God is the law of God. Before we called it the Bible, before the New Te Testament was even constructed, when they were talking, they talked about the, the, the law and the prophets. The law and the prophets was the Bible, right? The law and the prophets, the Pentateuch, all that, like we would have we just called that the Bible. We would have called that the Old Testament. But Christ was teaching us. He said, I didn't come to do away with that, right? And so I want to hit on this because we like this is part of the delusion. This is part of the strong delusion that's being released, right? This, this is part of the deception that that's out there right so satan it's crazy it's crazy how it works right so satan is putting this lie out there because as he, he knows that he knows at a certain point you know what i'm saying like like god like god is going that grace is going to expire and he's going to start turning people over to judgment he's going to start turning people over to a reprobate mind so satan puts all this stuff out here to get people distracted and get them into the lie so that way when god releases this strong delusion they're one of those individuals that receive that strong delusion because they chose to believe the lie rather than the truth. Because at some point, the Most High let them know that they were believing the lie and not walking in the truth. But they, did, they, they were so in love with the unrighteousness, they didn't want to do away with their sinful ways and come to the knowledge of the truth and walk in the truth. It's too hard. Christ said, my yoke is easy, right? And my burden is light. But what's hard is we don't want to walk in that discipline. We don't want to walk in that level of accountability. Because if there's no standard for you to hold me to, I can live how I want to live. But people, and that's the thing, like that's the preparation of the lawless one. People want to live how they want to live. But the only way you can be okay with believing that you can live how you want to live is you got to erase the standard. Right? The word law, like people hate the word law. But if you really break it down, it just means instruction. People got, we, we had this fancy acronym, you know, the Bible stands for basic instructions for before leaving earth. Right. But it basic laws before leaving earth, if you want to do it that way, because it just means instruction. Right. And the Bible always tells us how like there's wisdom in the instruction of God, like there's life in the instruction of God. Right. And we're fine with those verses, but we don't want to put the precepts together that shows that the word instruction is a law is interchangeable. Right. So we have to understand that that this this erasing of boundaries, this erasing of standards. It's erasing of the law and different things like that is ultimately this is the working of Satan. Because Satan knows at a certain point, the lawless one, and that's what man, it's crazy because that's what Second Thessalonians says. It says the coming of the lawless one is the working of the power of Satan. And all lying wonders and all signs and all these different things, like Satan is orchestrating all of that and and and, and trying to get people in a position where they don't see the law of God as relevant. Because it, it creates, it cultivates and prepares the way for people to have lawlessness and lawless behavior. So that way, when the lawless one arrives, they're primed to receive them, right? And so I, I'll, I'll say it like this, um, because we see here in, in Matthew, and I, I want to break this down because I'm going to break this little verse down because we, we have to see this, all right? We have to see this. I'm trying to show y'all something. Some of, some of y'all might know, and if you're doing this as confirmation, and, and praise God, right? But let me let me show you this. And, and this is what I think is, is specific, right? Christ is very specific. The Bible is very specific, but ultimately what happens is we try, we try to pick and choose. We try to make it, we try to, we try to make it fit our life. We don't want to adapt to the word. We want the word to adapt to us. That's backwards, right? Christ, I believe, after studying this a little bit more today, right? And, and looking more into it to, to, to make sure I was on point. This is this is what I believe that Christ, like Christ knew what was gonna happen, right? So he said, he said, think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I come not to destroy, but to fulfill, right? A lot of people latch onto that word fulfill. And they'll go to the concordance, and there's like seven definitions. And they'll pick the definition that that meet, that fits their understanding of that text, but it doesn't make sense. 
because the, 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 the definition from that word that they tend to, to, to select means to end or to terminate. It would, it would make no sense for Christ to say, I am not come to destroy, but to destroy. The, the, the word that they pick from the, like the definition that they take from the concordance, from the word that's there, says to terminate, to abolish, to do away with. It would not make sense for Christ to say, think not that I come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to destroy, but to abolish, but to do away with. That makes no sense, but that's what people accept, right? And then it says, for verily I say unto you, and this is why I think Christ anticipated that. So he, he said, let me go ahead and make this reference so you can put a precept to make sure that you're not led astray. Till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled, right? We just saw in Revelation 21, that's when heaven and earth pass. So heaven and earth hasn't passed yet, so what Christ is saying is this standard is still here. And we have to understand that because that standard, and if, if you look at how society is going, society is becoming so against the law of God. The only way you're going to be able to discern what's right from what's wrong is you have to know these precepts. You have to understand what the law of God is so that way you can stand on it. That's, that's the whole purpose why he gave it, to teach them, like, this is how you recognize good from evil, right? It was never intended it was never intended to, 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 to be what Christ did, right? So Christ is the propitiation and the atonement for our sin. But when God gave us the law, it's like what Paul said, like, I wouldn't have known that I shouldn't covet if the law didn't say thou shalt not covet. So he said, is the law sin? Certainly not, right? So our, our, our salvation is not, like, like, we put our faith in Christ, but we have to understand that this helps build our discernment. And the thing that's key with this is this, right? The word fulfill. Like there's a definition there that says that that means like perfect or to make complete or to like make whole, right? So under like understanding like like the 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 how the sacrifices and everything were worked out before with blood of bull and goats and sometimes people having to die for their own sins and different things like that. Ultimately, what we have to see is this. What what we have to understand is like God tells us that He wasn't like that was incomplete. Like that, that stuff could not satisfy it. Like it wasn't able to render what the blood of Christ could render, right? But beyond that, we have to understand that the lawless, like the spirit of lawlessness is abounding heavily, right? And everywhere we look, everywhere we see, like the more that we're progressing, where we see like more and more of, of boundaries and standards and structures that the Most High had designed into earth being erased and being eradicated. And the scripture that's coming into my mind right now is, you know, a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? So, like, it's way back, talking about centuries back, around the time when, when Christ walked the earth, and after he, after he had uh, laid his life down and ascended, we see that Satan began working the deception. He began working the deception. He began working the deception. You know what I'm saying? Because he, he's always been walk, like trying to do this deception and all this other stuff. But like he began working this deception from this angle, right? That's where you see the early church and, and how they the, the early followers of Christ, they practice a different style of, they, they, their walk was different. And a lot of stuff we see in the church today is not what they practice, right? But Satan's goal was, let me just get a little bit of this in there. Because a little leaven leavens the whole lump, right? So I get a little bit of this in there. And if you know anything about the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you know, you know that yeast and that leaven, you know, that, that typically is, is, is symbolic of the sin, right? So let me put a little bit of this in there. And then it grows, right? Well, I put this in here. So let me go and put that in there. And then before you know it, over time, there's so much sin and corruption in the body of Christ. The word is so watered down and polluted. People believe any people, people believe anything they want to believe, right? So um I, I'm I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm gonna I'm gonna leave it there. Um because I want to talk more about the lawless one next week and we're gonna break more precepts down tomorrow. But I just I'm hoping that this gives some understanding. We have to understand that um like the strong delusion, people are people are walking against the word of God, right? People are are are, are living in a way that's contrary to what the word says. And we don't even understand that the whole reason why Satan is doing this is because he knows 
that God, if God sets his face against you, then who going to save you from the hand of God? Right? Like, like no one can save you from the wrath of God. That's why Christ came. The only thing strong enough to stop the wrath of God is the love of God. So Christ was like, Christ, and through, through the death of Christ is how the love of God was made manifest, right? So we see this. And it's like, so if, if the Most High sets his face against you, who going to save you? So Satan's goal is to get us walking in a way that's contrary, you know what I'm saying, to make us hypocritical because God can't stand a hypocrite. He's trying to get us to walk in a way that's displeasing to the Father. So when God began to move these judgments, like he, like, like, you know, when he begins to do what he's going to do, we're going to fall victim with it, right? We'll fall victim with it. And a lot of people don't see that. So, so when God is calling out to us and, and he's trying to get us to return and, and get on point in righteousness, it's because he's trying to get us positioned. He's, it's, uh, Passover's coming to my, to my mind. And the, the way, the image that the Most High is giving me right now was like in Exodus, right? The Passover, the blood on the lamb. He's trying to get us underneath that doorpost. He's trying to make sure like we covered with the blood. He's trying to make sure that, that we in right standing where we need to be. So when that stuff come and pass right on over us, it passed over us. Right. But those who ain't covered, they got some goat blood up there. They got the wrong. <laughs> they got some tainted blood up there. You know, when this stuff come, it ain't going to pass over them. And then they're going to be looking like what's going on. Right. But um, so I, I'll say this last point that way. I, um, So I don't miss it. But this this is the point I was talking about where it says, like, for verily I say unto you to heaven and earth pass one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law to all be fulfilled. Right. So some People will preach and say that, you know, when Christ was on the cross, he said, it is finished. That's when all was fulfilled. That's not what that means. That's not what Christ, that's not what he was saying. His purpose, his, his propitiate, like what he came to do, it, it was finished. But in Revelation chapter 21, if you keep reading past down to the rest of the verses, you'll start, the Bible, I'll tell you, it interprets itself. It starts to show you what it means when it says all is fulfilled. The father explain he breaks down what all fulfilled is. So Christ is telling us like all has not been fulfilled. Right. And, and, and how this connects with second Thessalonians, it says like, they'll tell you that the day of Christ has come the day of Christ, like this stuff in revelation, the day of Christ, the new heaven, the new earth, you have to see how all of this stuff works together. Right. So when people are saying, Oh, well, you know, this is done away with, and you know, Christ fulfilled it all and different things like that. A lot of people don't even realize that what they're doing is they're teaching exactly what Second Thessalonians said they would teach, which was that the day was pretty, um, pretty much they're saying like the day of Christ has already came because this stuff isn't supposed to happen until after the day of Christ. Right. But um, I'll leave it there. Let me I'll leave it there. Um, and then I, I'm going to go ahead and pray this out and then we will open up some. Um, I'll open it up for any questions that anyone um, might have. All right. So. So Heavenly Father, um, Lord, we come before you. We just thank you for the blood of, of our Savior and our Messiah. We thank you for our faith in you. We thank you for the word that gives us life. We thank you for your spirit and the spirit of Christ, which, which gives us understanding. And Father, we just thank you for your continuous grace and your mercy. And Father, we thank you for you're the one who gives us eyes to see and ears to hear. Father, you're the one who softens our heart to receive the truth. Father, you're the one who protects us and covers us and keeps us from being led astray. You can keep us from temptation. You can keep us from a strong delusion. You can keep us from believing in the falsehoods and, and, and misinterpreting the precepts which you have given us. Father, continue to help us grow in your wisdom. Continue to help us grow in your knowledge. Continue to help us grow in your love and in your understanding. Father, help us to, to, to be who you have called us to be, to be that beacon of light, to point others to the hope that is found in Christ. Father, if there's any of us in here that are walking in a way that's not pleasing to you, Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will convict us. Your word says the Holy Spirit came to convict us of our sins. So, Father, convict us so that we may be um, turned to repentance, Father, so that we might seek your throne of grace and we might seek out Christ to, to, to receive your mercy. Father, help us show the ways that, that we might be a hypocrite before your eyes. Father, purify us and cleanse us. Father, return us to our first love. Return us to who we are supposed to be in you. Strengthen your hand in our life. Strengthen us as the men and women of God that you desire us to be and help us to live solely and purely dedicated and wholehearted to you. Father, we pray all these things in the name of your son.